The Texas legislative session is well underway, but tomorrow the governor will give a state of the state address that's a little unusual, not necessarily for what he's going to say, but where it's going to be and who's going to be in the audience and who's not. Scott Braddock is the editor with the Quorum Report. He joins us live. Scott just joined us many times before. Scott, appreciate your time as always. Of course, why good to see you. the secrecy around the state of the state address and why I, it's my understanding yeah. that no media is going to be allowed in the room? That's correct. And look, I think I have a couple of thoughts about this, uh, large uh, sort of uh, sweeping thoughts about it. Number one, I think that Governor Abbott became very comfortable in sort of the COVID cocoon. And what I mean by that is if you think about the kind of power he's been able to uh, amass in his office, thanks to uh, the COVID disaster declarations, which remain in effect today, right? Even though, uh, you know, most people are not wearing masks anymore and people who uh, were going to get a vaccine have already been vaccinated. That debate seems to be uh, largely over in Texas. Uh, but the governor got really comfortable with it. You might remember uh, that it, for his last state of the state, this is the way he did it. A Away from the Texas Capitol, uh, somewhere else in a, what had been, you know, a previously undisclosed location, uh, and uh, sort of in the cocoon is the way I would describe it. Not having to interact with the legislature. Uh, that's one thing. The other thing is that if Governor Abbott is going to be running for president, I'll get right to it. And I get this question all the time: Is he thinking about running? Is he, you know, in contention? Well, the polling nationally doesn't show that he is. But I've kind of, uh, you know, gotten to where I think about him like a 737 that's in a holding pattern over the airport. You know, just in case he might want to go in for a landing if, you know, former President Trump's candidacy doesn't work out or you know the field seems to be open for him. Um, and the fact is that this governor thrives best in environments that are very controlled. No media, not much interaction with a crowd, and certainly not much interaction with the folks who were supposed to be his partners in the legislative process. That would be the legislators themselves. And attendees were originally supposed to sign non-disclosure agreements to be in the mm -hmm. audience. Is that right? Right. Totally bizarre. Uh, the 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 it's interesting that you raise it. The venue where this was supposed to happen, they had said this company in San Marcos had said that there were some security concerns. And so they wanted attendees to sign NDAs, non-disclosure agreements. Um, but that was eventually rescinded. There was some pushback, I think, from the people who were invited to go. But uh, the people who are going to be in attendance are still required to leave their cell phones out in their cars and not bring them inside. Uh, so, again, there's this veil of secrecy. I, I would just describe it as strange. Yeah, very strange. All right, let's move on to what we may hear tomorrow uh, with, you know, no legislators, only invited guests, no media in this room in San mm -hmm. Marcos is my understanding. What right. do you expect to hear from the governor? Listening for a few things tomorrow, um, his emergency items, which he has traditionally laid out during his state of the state, he doesn't actually have to do it that way, but that's the way this governor has done it. We will look to see uh, what things the governor exercises his power about. I think when people hear the term emergency item, maybe it's misunderstood a little bit. Uh, it's not that they're actual emergencies the way you think of it, like breaking the glass or calling 911. Um, in the first 60 days of a legislative session, uh, per the Texas Constitution, legislators can't take up and consider any legislation unless the governor gives them the green light on a topic by designated, you know, designating that topic an emergency item. When he does that, it's an exercise of his power. Uh, although it's coming a little later in the legislative session, so it's, you know, functionally it doesn't have that much meaning anymore. But I do think symbolically with this governor, when he designates a topic as an emergency item, that means it's his top, top priority list. And so, for example, on school vouchers, listen for this. If the governor talks a lot about school vouchers, which I expect him to do, he'll talk a lot about school choice, empowering parents and, and money following the child, all of that stuff. He's definitely going to say that. But does he actually designate it an emergency item? If he does, I think what he's signaling to lawmakers is if y'all don't pass some piece of legislation on this during the regular session, well, then get ready for a long, hot summer in Austin because we're going to be here talking about it during a special session or multiple special sessions. What about property tax relief? That is something that continues to come up when it comes to the governor's priorities. But any specifics you're expecting to hear or have heard it, you know, since he was inaugurated? Nothing's leaked out from the governor other than the number that he'd like to spend on property tax relief. Uh, he had originally talked about something like 13 uh, 
billion dollars for that, Myra. Uh, and he's recently said more like 15 billion is what he would like to see the legislature allocate for quote unquote property tax relief. Exactly what form that's going to take. We've heard more specifics from the lieutenant governor, who of course presides over the Texas Senate. He has said that one of his top priorities is to increase the homestead exemption in Texas up to seventy thousand dollars. That's what's in the base budget, uh, the uh, the initial salvo, if you will, from the Texas Senate. It looks like the Texas House may go along with that. I was talking with some veteran legislators and former legislators who have said, look, what they ought to do if they want to offer property tax relief to everyone, and that would be homeowners uh, as well as uh, you know people who own you know business owners who own uh, you know big box retail stores and oil and gas interests that have refineries on the coast, for example. What they really need to do is flow more money through the school funding for, uh, formulas, which in 2019 cost something like three billion dollars, uh, and thanks to population growth and appraisal growth, uh, that costs probably the same exact. Uh, sort of property tax relief that's the the state sending money down to ISDs that would cost probably something about something like about 5.5 billion or 6 billion uh, given that growth in uh, population and appraisal so so here's the good news about that they do have the money but whether that's sustainable going forward that's another question because as you know we do expect to see some kind of the R word this year a recession even the comptroller in laying out uh, this record budget surplus said that he does expect Texas to have what he described at least as a mild recession sometime this year. What about the power grid? Before we let you go here, we're mm -hmm. two years out from the anniversary of when, you know, the, the grid failed in Texas. Mm -hmm. And the governor has said a lot has been done to shore that up to keep us from being mm -hmm. in that position again. But he also signaling he supports a plan mm -hmm. from the Public Utility Commission that would really change the energy market in Texas to prevent that from happening. Myra, you remember after he passed, uh, he, he uh, uh, signed a, a raft of legislation addressing the uh, energy grid uh, two years ago. The governor said everything that needed to be done was done when it came to the grid. He has changed his tone lately, right? And he has said uh, in his inaugural address and in the comments you're talking about that we need to build a more stable grid. The PUC, the Public Utility Commission, all those commissioners appointed by Abbott did sign off on a plan to sort of redesign the grid. The short version of it is that uh, rate payers around the state would pay more for an electricity grid that's considered to be more reliable. But the lieutenant governor, he and the uh, governor don't agree on this. Dan Patrick has said that uh, he doesn't like that plan from the PUC. Uh, and you're going to see some more hearings on that in the Texas Senate uh, as soon as tomorrow. The lieutenant governor has been pretty consistent about saying, no, what we need to do is is create more of what we have, which is more thermal generation. He's looking to expand natural gas generation in particular. That's going to be a tussle during the legislative session, something we'll all watch closely. Scott Braddock, editor with the Quorum Report. Always appreciate your time, Scott. Steve Myra, thank you. We'll see you next time, and we'll be right back. You might have heard some of the buzz about a diabetes drug that is being used for weight loss. Many, especially those who are struggling with life-threatening obesity who don't have diabetes, are finding it can help them lose a significant amount of weight. Ursula Perry with what you should know about this newly approved medication. It's been called a national epidemic. 42% of American adults are obese. By 2030, experts predict that number will swell to 50%. We have to treat obesity as we would treat any other chronic treatable disease. Her Yale colleagues are studying the impact of the diabetes medication called Tezepatide. It's sold under the brand name Monharo. In a trial called Surmount One, researchers studied the once weekly injectable in 2,500 adults who did not have diabetes, and it found significant weight loss at 72 weeks. The individuals who received the highest dose of the medication, 15 milligrams of trisepatide, 40% of them lost greater than or equal to 25% of their total body weight. Think of it this way. That means a person who weighed 200 pounds slimmed down to 150. These types of results we have not seen with any other phase three trial in individuals with obesity with any other agent. So definitely very significant. And possibly provide a new tool for weight loss when diet and exercise just aren't working. Right now, the FDA has approved the drug for fast track review, which means that it's going to be reviewed a lot faster than usual so that it can be put on the market for chronic weight management. Ursula Perry, KSAT 12 News. All right, look outside with live cam. Very warm out there today, but hold on. Things are changing, Adam. 
Oh, it's still February here in South Texas, so get ready for a bit of a temperature whiplash that's on the way. 78 degrees officially at the airport now by 9 o'clock. We're still near 70. Midnight at 64, so a mild evening and humid out there until after midnight when a cold front moves through. Temperatures fall down to near 50 degrees by early tomorrow morning and even more changes to talk about with that cold front. We'll talk about how much this uh, dose of reality, how long it's going to stick around in just a bit. Ah, yes, it is winter in South Texas. One day it's 76. The next day, you know, let's say 25 degrees cooler. Cold. It's cold. Yeah, we hit 81 at the airport today and, you know, two years ago today, we had a morning low of nine, Ooh. which was a record for the day. Of course, we woke up to nearly four inches of snow and then all the fun and games um, went south pretty quickly. We don't need to revisit that right now. Let's look ahead to what's coming our way. Cool and windy starting tomorrow. A light freeze by Friday and Saturday mornings and jacket weather basically tomorrow all the way through Saturday. So let's take a look at the temperatures now. See where the cold front is. Look at Amarillo down to 29, Albuquerque 32, even get up to Guyman, Oklahoma. It's 23 degrees and that cooler air, of course, is on the back side of the cold front and we're going to get clipped by some of that cooler air. Even Midland 58 but then you go to Junction, it's 84, and Del Rio still at 92 degrees after a record high today of 95. So very warm today. Still 73 New Braunfels, Kerrville right now at 74. And we're starting to see most of our temperatures locally dip down into the 70s, but it's going to be a gradual drop off this evening. We're not going to see our temperatures plummet this evening. That'll happen more so tomorrow at this time. But tomorrow morning, we're going to start the day in the upper 40s around town, even some mid 40s in the hill country, Canyon Lake 46. Uh, Nixon started the day at 53, Castroville 49 and Rio Medina 46. Throughout the day, the temperatures aren't going to warm up very much. We'll get to 56 at noon and then only about 59 for the high temperature tomorrow with a decent amount of sunshine. So that's it says a lot when you have a lot of sunshine, but still we can't get those temperatures really into the 60s and it's going to get even cooler thereafter. So looking at the highs tomorrow, many of us in the upper 50s, I do think south of Highway 90, we'll see some 60s, Poteet and Floresville 63, Hondo right about 60 degrees. But then by Friday, we trim off a few more degrees, 56, the high in San Antonio, Saturday briefly and barely hitting 60 before we warm back up well into the 70s for the second half of the weekend and into next week as well. If you like this weather, by early next week, we'll be back in the lower 80s again. Here's the big picture. You see a lot of snow with on the cold side of the system, especially on the north end of that upper low. Ski resorts, Colorado, New Mexico, loving this. I'll tell you that this is some good snow for them and some good moisture for some folks as well, but it's just not making its way here. This is the upper level component to it. This big trough that dip in the upper level flow centered over Colorado, and that's going to bypass us and really not throw much energy our way. We could see a brief shower overnight between about 11 p.m. and 3 a.m. Really nothing to even hope for because it's going to be very negligible. We do have a little more hope in this upper system that's going to be off the California coastline this weekend. It's going to drift over the Pacific for a few days, then get caught up in our upper level flow. And by the middle of next week, Tuesday night into early Wednesday, we could have a few showers from that. It at least gives us a little better chance of some areas of rain, but otherwise dry. 78 right now. Let's talk about the wind southeast at 11, but it had been gusting higher. Get ready for some much higher wind gusts. That cold front moves through at midnight by 3 a.m. We're talking wind gusts up to 30 to 35 miles per hour. Tomorrow morning at 7 a.m. We could see some wind gusts around and in excess of 40 miles per hour. So one of those blustery days, not just cooler, but also windy. And if it's your trash recycling organics bin day, I know I say this a lot, but once that truck come by, comes by and empties it and sets it back down, it can tumble, tumble away really quickly. Also, the high winds combined with the very dry air behind the front enhances the fire risk, especially west of San Antonio along the Rio Grande, but even Hondo, Uvalde, Lakey areas, Pearsall, Dilly, and points westward. That just means if there's a fire, it would spread rapidly. Friday morning, 32 by the afternoon. 56 
So below average again, Saturday, 32 in the morning, then right near 60. We get into next week, a little bit of added moisture, kind of spring like again, that morning fog starting on Monday, and you'll kind of get used to that trend for the early part of next week. It is still winter. Mm -hmm. Big changes. Mm -hmm. We'll be right back. A local company creating a way for medical supplies and people to be transported around the world with rockets. Night Aerospace in Port San Antonio worked on this project for years now, having created these units originally for the Royal Canadian Air Force. Our Tiffany Huertas gives us an inside look at the technology used for this program. Imagine a rocket cargo going across the earth and within two hours can deliver humanitarian aid and other means to support natural disasters. That is being designed here at Night Aerospace, located at Port San Antonio. We received a small business innovation research contract from the United States Air Force to support uh, future aspirations of moving cargo humanitarian aid using rockets. Michael Knight's grandfather started this company that continues to grow. So we're seen as a industry leader in cargo handling systems, cargo movement. Night Aerospace started in 1992 and created units to transport high ranking military officials and others. Today, they're creating these units for medical purposes. This entire module is 100% sealed. This is the second unit they have created for the Royal Canadian Air Force. It's meant to transport any medical situation for the Air Force or the Canadian government or ally nations. Um, it's also being utilized to transport infectious disease patients. Knight says the first unit delivered has already been used in different situations. Successfully moved a family, a Royal Canadian Air Force um, individual and his family from Africa back to Canada. They've used it a lot domestically to transport individuals from hospitals to other hospitals that aren't overcrowded. He is excited for the future of the company. We're moving with the times of different means of transportation with Rocket being the next one. Tiffany Huertas, KSAT 12 News. Take a look at traffic as we approach 7 o'clock here. Let's go to 410 at Fredericksburg. Looks like, yes, traffic is steady, but it is moving. No issues from this camera angle. No, not at all. And I-10 at Probant, and you can see traffic also moving there. These are two very busy areas of town. Usually they are still busy, but no major traffic tie-ups to tell you about, and that is a good thing. It's a little sticky outside, a little humid. That's going to change, though, significantly overnight. A cold front's going to move through. I wish it could really squeeze out much rain, but it's not going to. Just a few little small brief showers along that front between about 11 p.m. and 3 a.m., and that's about it. Basically, don't count on any rain here. And there's slightly better hope next Tuesday night. Otherwise, cooler, windy, 59 the high tomorrow. Light freeze Friday morning, then only 56 in the afternoon, and very similar into Saturday. All right, thanks, Adam, and thank you for watching the News at 6. See you tonight on the Night Beat at 10.